This video is brought to you by Ground News. Stick around to hear more about the special offer they are providing to the entire Upper Echelon community. All right, now that the proverbial dust has settled with regards to the whole Tenet media and YouTube propaganda situation, I wanted to finally take a look at the story myself, talk about what we know, what we don't know, and also give my thoughts on where I think a substantial number of people who already talked about the situation went wrong because they got dragged down by surface level interpretations and continue to do so even when confronted directly by evidence that surface level interpretations was precisely the goal of the entire propaganda campaign. Let's begin with context. On September 4th of 2024, a U.S. Department of Justice indictment was unsealed, formally accusing a U.S.-based company, widely believed to be Tenet Media, of accepting $10 million from Russian state actors in order to produce Russian propaganda. The indictment didn't contain actual names, mind you, but it didn't take long until people began putting the dots together and identified who the listed parties most likely were. The homepage for Tenet Media has since been taken offline, but archives will show that the prominent focus of the website was a collection of conservative commentators with content centered on US political issues and topics of culture war. The YouTube channel has also been taken down, but for an example of what they were producing, we can look at the still public Rumble page, which has all of their videos publicly available. Here's where I have to give a boring sort of summary, but it's important to know who the players are. Tenet Media was originally founded by a couple, Lauren Chen and her husband, Liam Donovan, later expanding to hold a substantial roster of big-name conservative commentators like Benny Johnson, Lauren Southern, Dave Rubin, and Tim Poole, among others. Tenet Media, as per the DOJ indictment throughout its lifespan, accepted roughly $10 million from Russian state actors in order to fund their ongoing operations, and they did this for the purpose of securing favorable media from those creators and publishing it on their in-house channels. The indictment seems to allege that downstream creators like Tim Pool or Benny Johnson were not actually aware of these financial ties. However, regarding the two founders of the company, Lauren Chen and her husband, Liam Donovan, the story seems a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna be overly specific here and draw a bunch of quotes from the indictment itself. I have read it, I've taken notes from it, and most importantly, I've highlighted pretty much everything I think is most relevant from it. But the evidence presented seems clearly designed to showcase that while downstream commentators contracted by Tenet Media may not have known where the money was coming from, the two founders probably did. And even if they didn't, it would be an astoundingly bad failure of due diligence on their part, considering the warning signs and all of their private communication. I should be clear on this part, the DOJ has a terrifying conviction rate on federal cases. According to Pew Research, less than 1% of the studied 79,000 total cases went to trial and resulted in acquittal. So becoming the target of a DOJ indictment like this is, metaphorically speaking of course, basically a sealed coffin. However, none of these conservative commentators, YouTubers, and media figures are the designated targets. They're not even named, actually. They're simply referred to by monikers such as Founder 1 or Commentator 3, because the targets of this indictment are the Russian agents responsible for operating the scheme, which is important. Why is it important? Well. Because once you understand what the indictment says, the next thing we need to understand is why the indictment says it at all and why the entire thing is structured in this way because without critically evaluating that, how can we possibly draw the correct conclusions? Which I'll get to in just a minute. There's something I wanna talk about quickly here which is extremely relevant lately on a personal level and also extremely relevant because of current events and that is the concept of breaking your echo chamber. That's not always a comfortable thing to do. Lately, it seems like a lot of people almost deliberately try to insulate themselves with a blanket of similar, never contrary opinions. And to me, that's a very significant problem. If you wanna do that, fine, I can't stop you. But if you wanna make an effort to break out of a self-reinforcing echo chamber, today's video sponsor is basically purpose-built to help you do that. And it's called Ground News. Ground News is a media aggregate service which cuts through bias and provides as much information as possible to you, the readers. It works by gathering everything in one place, as well as marking bias and corporate ownership, among other things, which allows you to compare article headlines and overall content between outlets. But the number one thing that I find myself appreciating lately is a tool that they offer called My News Bias. Regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum, understanding the media bubble that you exist in, because nearly all of us do exist in some sort of media bubble, and much more importantly, breaking out of that media bubble is an invaluable thing to achieve. And with a variety of other tools available in the service, Ground News is the best thing that I have yet found for someone to achieve that goal. They don't push one particular ethos or perspective. They simply offer excellent tools for the evaluation of breaking news when most of what you read is designed to have some sort of influence on you. Maybe you agree mostly with one side even, but you should, at the very least, hear what the other side has to say. Ground News is one of the most well-designed mechanisms of doing that that I have found so far, 
making me happy to accept them as a video sponsor. If you click the link down below in the description or scan the QR code to sign up, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan. Again, link down below, ground.news slash echelon for 40% off a Vantage plan today. Big thank you to Ground News for sponsoring the channel. Okay, back to it. After this indictment went public, social media went wild with speculation and criticism over what these creators may or may not have known, with memes and accusations and political gloating of all kinds, pretty much everything you can possibly think of. It certainly didn't help that people like Tim Poole and Benny Johnson were referring to it as a leaked indictment in their immediate responses when the document itself is posted directly on justice.gov. But much more important than the frantic backpedaling, distancing language, or accusations are the reasonable inferences we can draw. First, this is what's called a speaking indictment, which means an indictment that goes dramatically beyond a standard concise language instead choosing to showcase a complete narrative with conclusory language, which would normally only be seen in the opening or closing arguments of a jury trial. It's worth noting here, speaking indictments are somewhat controversial and also not exactly common. They're becoming much more common, but right now a speaking indictment typically ends up serving the purpose of amplifying whatever case it is for media coverage and public consumption pre-trial by spreading the government's theory slash narrative to a much larger audience. Second, the Russian agents, in this case the agents associated with RT, also known as Russia Today, massively overpaid for a relatively small media footprint, which I find to be kind of hilarious. There's a section of the indictment where they complain about the fact that the commentators aren't sharing enough of their videos or they're doing too much self-promotion. It's genuinely funny to me to sit here and think about like Russian agents getting pissed off as a bunch of conservative YouTubers get paid way too much money to just not do a good job even spreading the propaganda, and focusing too much on self-promotion. That is objectively funny. Just to emphasize that point, Tenet Media, a $10 million backed foreign influence campaign really, has 12,000 followers on Rumble, whereas I, a random YouTuber who hasn't touched the platform in nine months, has nearly triple that number. I used to have all my uploads mirrored over there, and then the functionality broke because of a lawsuit between Rumble and YouTube, and I didn't really do much with it since, even though I definitely should. But even still, I myself have 30,000 followers, over 30,000. Can you imagine how big my channel would be if I had $10 million from Russia to build it? Tenant Media apparently had about 16 million views on YouTube before it got nuked with over 2,000 total videos. And if you consider the $10 million investment figure on that, it's like paying $600 per thousand views which is like 30 times higher than any competent brand would ever pay. One of two things is true here, or maybe they both are, if we're being totally honest. Either A, the conservative content creator circle is so incredibly talented at grifting money, they managed to get 30 times as much as they ever should have from Russian agents. Or B, the Russian agents are so unbelievably bad at social media spending, they somehow threw millions of dollars more than they needed to with any sort of competent strategy at big name creators who subsequently ripped them off. It's funny no matter how you slice it. By these metrics, my channel alone would be worth a ballpark $80 million pretty easily to these people without breaking a sweat, which is just completely insane. But the thing I'm failing to mention, as I make fun of the fact that these creators were getting horrifically overpaid, is that they're not being paid for standard advertising. They're being paid to sow division and help destabilize American culture. This is the part where some people get angry because they simply can't handle listening to something that threatens their pre-programmed worldview, but the truth here is that Russia operates a incredibly large social media propaganda apparatus, generally speaking, across the entire world, and that construct doesn't actually care about liberal or conservative values. And People need to stop thinking about it that way. It's not just aimed at America, by the way, but before people get all defensive and start whining in the comment section about whatever incoherent partisan garbage they think makes some sort of sense, Let's take a very precise example and expand on it. In 2020, a Facebook page called In The Now was officially labeled by the platform as Russian state-owned media. After this happened, a company called Mafic LLC, the parent company of In The Now, as well as the parent company of another outlet called Soapbox, decided to sue Facebook publicly because of that label, ultimately getting struck down in the process. But then in 2021, according to Open Secrets, Mafic LLC officially registered themselves as, quote, a foreign agent of Russia's state-owned media, end quote. Well, shifting gears now, in 2023, 
A retroactive analysis out of Stanford University had this to say, quote, we conduct a qualitative content analysis of 2014 Facebook posts of the Black Lives Matter BLM protests in the United States over the summer of 2020 to comparatively examine the overt propaganda strategies of six Russian-linked news organizations, RT, Ruptly, Soapbox, In The Now, Sputnik, and Redfish. We found that RT and Sputnik diverged in their framing of the BLM movement from newer media properties. RT and Sputnik primarily produced negative coverage of the BLM movement, painting protesters as violent or discuss the hypocrisy of racial justice in America. In contrast, newer media properties like In The Now, Soapbox, and Redfish supported the BLM movement with clickbait-style videos highlighting racism in America." End quote. I hope everyone can see what I'm saying, but let's connect the dots. The reason I picked these two outlets, In The Now and Soapbox, is because they self-identify as Russian state-controlled media, so we don't have to trust anyone's personal definition of what does or does not qualify as that. During the 2020 BLM riots, RT, Russia Today, was on one side of the social debate, while multiple other affiliated state-owned Russian propaganda outlets, those being In The Now and Soapbox under Mafic LLC, were amplifying pro-BLM messaging simply to cause division. Russian propaganda was provably jumping on board with massive budgets and social media campaigns on both sides of the very same issue, because their actual legitimate goal has nothing to do with moral, ethical, or principled stances, and everything to do with destabilizing civilian culture. Just to cut this off at the knees right now before anyone starts whining in the comments about how the other side... <sighs> I don't want to fucking hear it, okay? You are the problem, because these propaganda campaigns are designed to prop up divisive content and get people against each other. Think about this rationally. What other possible motivation is there to overspend by millions of dollars like Tenet Media did on content that makes people hate each other, while you simultaneously spend millions of dollars through separate but also directly connected state media arms amplifying their opposition with equally divisive counterpoints? Picture it this way. Why on earth would an arms dealer, for example, sell weapons to both sides of a conflict? Why would they do it? Profit? Sure, maybe. But what if the arms dealer wasn't making any money? Run through it again. An arms dealer is selling weapons to both sides of a conflict by overspending dramatically in the process. Why do it in the first place? Answer? Because they want to increase the size, scope, and severity of the conflict while making sure it continues, because they somehow benefit from the conflict itself in a way that justifies spending millions of dollars to exacerbate it. That's it. Now for the connection point. Tenet Media is a tiny, insignificant drop in the bucket when compared to the complete global propaganda network of Russia. It certainly matters, don't get me wrong, but it's not some sort of central hub of activity, by any stretch, and the indictment we most recently saw is only against two people. However, if we look at the language they used, we find another clue, because not only was this a relatively uncommon speaking indictment, it also contained shockingly intimate details of behavior and activity perpetrated by the unnamed parties involved. The document outlines Google searches, emails, text messages, and basically every kind of private correspondence you could possibly have, and it does this publicly, which then resulted in the Tenet Media website being pulled down, YouTube suspending multiple large channels, as well as an untold number of additional actions taking place that we just don't know about, because this indictment was most likely a flex of the muscles, if you will where the United States intelligence community put out a very public shot across the bow. On social media, the reception has been incredibly shallow. Haha, <laughs> conservatives suck, they spew Russian propaganda, you name it, it's being said. But the deeper interpretation here is that a small portion of the overall massively influential Russian propaganda network got exposed, the cell responsible for it subsequently shut down operations and went underground, which was probably the reason they did it so publicly in the first place, as a sort of we see you, we know what you're doing type message, which is further evidenced in the indictment itself, with quotes about how this is just one of RT's covert projects in the United States. And all of this highlights just how far the infection has gone. A lot of people are reading into the Tenet media disaster as if it somehow supports their own personal narrative. And to be completely honest, most of them are wrong. Whether or not Lauren Chen and her husband are foreign agents, whether or not it's morally justified for YouTube to have now deleted all her personal channels, and whether or not Tim Pool or Benny Johnson or Dave Rubin ever knew where the money was coming from, it's just surface level commentary on a much deeper issue of political anxiety, which we might hope could be improved, possibly, 
by the recognition that there are entire media networks funded by rival superpowers designed to make us hate each other. How about we try to just not fall for that? I mean, if you're making content that a rival government wants to use because they're trying to destabilize us, dude, maybe you're making the wrong content. In the end, Tenet Media was a disruptive event for certain political circles, and my hope is that we can draw reasonable and helpful conclusions from it, rather than simply brushing it aside as if it's no big deal, which seems to be happening on the right, or fixating on it as overwhelming evidence of one-sided corruption, which seems to be happening on the left. That's it. If you want to support the channel, you can check out the links down below, the video sponsor for better media literacy, ground news, of course, locals and Patreon for monthly memberships, a special VPN deal, and more, but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching, more so than ever before, question everything, and have a nice night.